Good day, everybody, and welcome to Small Biz Aid Live. Our session today is uh, really, we hope, a very interesting one for all of you. Um, and in a moment, I will introduce you to your session moderator. Please use our, our session's Q&A section to ask questions. I will review these questions in the background and direct them to our moderator. But please be aware our audience size might mean that your specific question will not be answered. Um, in case that happens, please join our Alignable Small Business Groups at the end of this session to continue the dialogue. Links to these groups will be provided in chat throughout the session as well as at the end and are also posted on our agenda at smallbizaid.org. It's now my pleasure to introduce your session moderator, Eric Groves. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Small Biz Aid session on turning fans into communities. Uh, my name is Eric Groves, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Alignable. And for those of you who are not familiar with Alignable, we're an online community where over six and a half million small business owners meet and build trusted relationships with each other by connecting directly or participating in local industry and interest group discussions. Uh, so this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I am thrilled today to be joined by two incredible experts in pretty much every facet of building and participating in communities. Uh, let me introduce them to you and sh have them share a short soundbite about their background along with their passion uh, for working with local and small businesses. So first up, let me introduce you to Josh um, Popjack, who is a veteran local journalist and an advocate for local independent news. Uh, and uh, super excited to have Josh on the panel. Um, Josh, could you give us a brief background on yourself and what your passion's all about? Sure, and thank you uh, for having me on this panel. Uh, great to be here with you, Eric. Uh, I've been covering local news for about 15 years um, in uh, East Central Pennsylvania, uh, about an hour north of Philadelphia. And um, I've certainly been growing and maintaining communities that entire time, um, both in terms of readers and, and business uh, owners who are huge supporters of uh, my website now that I have, Sock and Source. And so I, in turn, am a big cheerleader for local business and uh, we have a, a great symbiotic relationship. Super, and that uh, Sock on Source is, a, is an online website where it's for a community, right? So it's got all kinds of local news and small businesses represented. So it's a great community in itself. Um, exactly. Let me turn, yeah, great, well, let me turn over to Howard. Uh, Howard Wolpoff is a marketing strategist um, he's an expert in finding pathways to new clients. So we're super excited to have uh, Howard on board with us. Howard, can you share a little bit about your background? Sure, and thank you for having me as well. Um, I am the Chief Marketing Strategist for Profit Master Business Solutions, and I work with small business owners and have for many years, really helping them address their needs and helping to grow their business. Uh, I've been working with communities for a long time, as, as Josh was speaking, made me think back a little bit. It goes back even to the early 2000s with uh, with the minor league baseball team that I helped uh, launch and market and, and setting up the I guess a fan uh, community in the in the background. Uh, very different then than it is now, but uh, it, as I've seen the strength as as time has gone on and, and how the, the uh, value comes to these companies. Awesome. Well, as a baseball fan, and, and and I know you went to school in New York, and you're close by New York. I'm sure you're both Red Sox fans, uh, but we won't go there. We'll continue on to a different topic. <laughs> well, um, as we all know, uh, COVID hit us uh, 15 months ago, and uh, we all went from interacting in person to masked up and hiding from each other, um, all whilst I'm trying to stay connected. And so... I, I thought we'd just start off with a little bit from both of you on how communities that you're a part of really helped you get through the past 15 months. And um, also, you know, what advice did you give to folks um, who were feeling isolated about the communities they could participate in um, during that time? So Josh, do you want to kick it off and then we'll have, hand it over to Howard? Sure. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we did was simply try to um, keep up with all of the changing like rules in, in Pennsylvania, of course, it was different in every state, but um, that was that was challenging for for readers, consumers, and business owners. So 
Um, we tried to be a, a great resource and we worked closely with our local chamber of commerce on that because obviously they were staying on top of um, all the changes uh, in terms of like who could be open and when. And this was particularly uh, challenging for restaurants. So we put a lot of time and energy into restaurants and um, making sure people were aware of like where they could get takeout. And as a lot of businesses had to suddenly pivot to be to offer takeout when they never had before. I mean, even fine dining. So, um, so that was that definitely kept us on our toes. But I think we we succeeded in terms of helping the businesses and uh, helping the readers because they wanted to support them, but they didn't know how necessarily. So, um, you know, it was it was a lot of work, but it was really rewarding too to be able to um, fill in that gap at that time because um, it was it was a very fearful time and some businesses had to launch GoFundMe's for um, you know keeping people on the payroll we shared those whenever we could um, that was a situation I never could have imagined but um, but I was happy to to help with that and um, most people I thought were very supportive of of uh, any business that needed to do that um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we we came through stronger, and and the businesses that you know adapted came through stronger as well. Yeah, that's a great example of the difference between sort of a community and just sort of a uh, uh, an email list, if you will. You know, I spent ten years at Constant Contact, I'm a big fan of email lists, but it's you know it's one to many, and when you have a situation like this where there's and there's a lot of people saying, well, but what about this? What about that? Having a community where that interactivity can happen and people can share best practices and advice and support each other. Give us um, 15 months. <laughs> we lost you there a little bit, Eric. Yeah, I lost myself too. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what was what was your takeaway? Um, mine was there was some different let's call it Facebook groups that I saw getting very active and supportive for people, but for me, it really ended up being a lot of the uh, Zoom networking. Um, I kind of mm -hmm. fell into an organization out of, and again, I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. I fell into an organization out of Northern California way back in May of last year as they were just starting to figure out how to address their local group in Northern California, and they started to expand. So what ended up being a Zoom event for them, in, uh, which was one event, right now there are 60 around the country and in four or five different countries as well that expanded to, and this network has really grown business relationships, but also uh, grown friendships. People were able to learn from people from all around the country of what uh, they were experiencing, how to help each other, how to network and keep their business going uh, through uh, social media activity on Facebook and on LinkedIn. You're able to really take that conversation further from these uh, the, these screens and do a lot more one-on-one -on -one, uh, networking after the fact and, and comment on people's posts and learn from the different uh, activities that people were involved with. It's uh, as I tell people when I explain this group, it's a happy neighborhood project, has made my network so much more interactive than it had been before the pandemic. So I, I see that as a, as a great success of, of what's gone on for the last 15 plus months. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we saw that a lot on Alignable as well, where we had uh, groups by industry and by interest. Uh, we actually had a survival group of florists that got together and literally were helping each other get through COVID um, just from their unique perspective. And that's, you know, that's what we all look for in these communities is some sense of affinity and a place where we can belong. Um, have you, any of you guys, either of you guys, um, so much time sort of thinking about customer communities and, you know, how to you know, create um, a relationship that is really interactive online um, with your customers uh, as opposed to sort of the traditional outbound marketing? I've seen it. I'll, I'll jump in quickly on this. I, this first thing that comes to my mind is really 20 years ago 
where we started this community with this minor league baseball team it was the the brooklyn cyclones in uh in new york and were able to come up with different events and, and some some interactive pieces back then but a lot of it depends on the type of company that you are in um if you if you have that relationship internally with your customers when they come in whether it's something broader that's uh that's event driven look if it's a if it's a bar and people aren't weren't able to come into the bar itself you do have bars that get to that second level of uh of bond with their uh, with their patrons i i i caught the uh the, the the movie about last night a couple of nights ago and it's all based on the, the a lot of it based on this this bar called mothers in chicago where people lived and breathed in softball teams and relationships and those types of businesses i i know some that did and could have carried on with video interaction and different uh group chats and and uh and activity and then when when the place is allowed for uh drive by take your order here's your drink uh of uh distribution i'm sure that was a, a great way to uh to keep things going on on their end that's a great point how about with you josh with your your advertisers and your community of businesses there you know how did you manage through the process of staying connected with them well and i i know i mentioned this to you eric um before we when we were emailing um i i basically have two communities of customers and they overlap my readers are my customers foremost because without them i don't have a website to sell advertising on um and my advertisers are also customers the problem with covid was that it brought i was in the middle of these two groups because um the advertisers were doing everything they could to stay in business um, but readers uh, were also upset, you know, if businesses were sort of, you know, flouting the rules, you know, and wanting me to report on that. So that put me in a really difficult position of, you know, how do I support the businesses and support my readers at the same time who are worried about safety? And and really, you couldn't you couldn't totally do both. Um, so I just kind of had to. You know, just you know, walk a fine line and um, and you know, n not get caught up in the you know petty you know back and forth of these types of situations. But um, yeah, I hope that that situation <laughs> doesn't happen again. I mean, normally um, everybody is working together, you know, to support the local businesses. But um, I think COVID, you know, exposed some. Some flaws, maybe in that, in potential flaws, and in, in how our relationships, you know, are put together. So, I don't, I don't know exactly what the answer is for, you know, the future. But, um, but you know, I, you know, I, I sort of like tried to be the, not be the policeman, but be the ambassador, be a diplomat. Yeah, it's it's a definitely a hard role to play. I know. I, I, that a couple of times when I would write an article about one one perspective or another, and yeah, you, know, you 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 couldn't you couldn't pick it perfect because you know you, you're going to make somebody upset in the process. Um, you, you, were you able to sort of co-opt some of your um, sort of super power users on either side to kind of help bridge the gap between the two, um, or did you try and play the the advocate the whole time? Um. I I did try and do that. I think with some degree with um, more like public officials or you know community leaders trying to get them to be um, sort of a voice of um, sanity. Uh, but at some point, like even they didn't really want to be involved because <laughs> it was right. just this super fraught um, you know situation. And if you're an elected official, you're also a politician, and, and you know your words are really being scrutinized. So, um, so we just kind of. I have a podcast in addition to my news reporting, and I try to leverage that as much as possible. Um, we did take a break from recording it during the height of COVID, but then once you know things were a little bit more certain as far as these transmission, we went back to using that and. 
Um, I think that was a good way to help bridge the gap because it was a little more um, relaxed in, in terms of like how we could talk about businesses and, um, you know, as far, my news site is basically straight news reporting. There's no opinion really or, or anything like that. Although we did, you know, have some, some opinions uh, about, you know, supporting local business, of course. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, there's no right answer. I don't think in terms of like a situation like that, you just have to, um, you know, put yourself in other people's shoes and be empathetic. Yeah. And, and Howard, if we kind of, you know, shift to a different time and place and think about the, the group um, that was the, the baseball um, group, yeah, how, how did you sort of co-opt in the raving fans and have them really uh, bring the community to life? If I'm not mistaken, I believe that it was fans that reached out to me about starting something. I believe we did it through Yahoo. And it was a Yahoo group that was set up way back when, when people used Yahoo. Um, and so they, so we started to, we didn't really publicize it with, on the, the website with the team. And I uh, believe that every once in a while we sent out an email and maybe have mentioned it there, but it started to build with those fans telling other fans that was there. We started, started to show up, uh, show up on search. People at, typed in Brooklyn Cyclones that helped uh, gather people. And it, it, it was an interesting, for, for me, it was an interesting way to measure how, uh, how different um, events went, the, the, the uh, sponsorships of, of giveaway items. Uh, we used to do a lot of uh, special videos on the, the broadcasts. Um, the, the Cyclones really were a, uh, an event. It was a show that we put on. It was low-level players uh, just coming out of high school, starting their careers that nobody really knew, a couple of high draft picks in there if you really followed to that level what the, who the draft picks were. But mm -hmm. most of these guys weren't going to the major leagues. So it was all about how to entertain people for three hours with their families at very low uh, expense for, the, uh, the, for, for going out. And uh, we got a lot of good feedback from those groups. And they, we also really showed who, what kind of players they liked and why based on their interactions on the, on the side. So it was a, a great way to have a, 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 an immediate pulse of, the, uh, of our audience. Yeah, you know, that's sort of fascinating is that you said it had the main event, which was the game itself, and then you had the community that rode along with it to sort of extend the, 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 the feeling or the, the belonging to that mainstream event, which was uh, in person. And then we shift to the past 15 months where the in, in person goes away and everything is online and virtual and, and the communities really become the place where all the action is happening. Um, to, to now, you know, getting to prognosticate and think a little bit about what's the world going to look like as we move forward. And, and from your perspectives, it would be great to sort of get your thoughts on and how the, you know, the really great things about community um, can live on and um, continue to help things like supporting local businesses or supporting um, a sports franchise. Um, and what are some of the key things from this past 15 months that you think um, really are, you know, things that changed but are going to stick with us as we all come back to starting to do little in-person live stuff again? Um, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, sure. A few a few thoughts on that is, is just I guess what I led in with uh, with online Zoom networking. Um, it's interesting to watch because that really now is is dipping down because everyone feels oh I can go back to my live events again I don't need this. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that as the year and I mentioned in a, in a group I was running earlier today by the end of the year we'll see a, it go back up a lot of it because people will go back and remember the things they didn't like about. Uh, in-person events and how especially the the, uh, the introverts really do better on a zoom event than a uh, than an in-person event trying to work the room and find people to uh, to connect with so th so these type of interactions on zoom on other video platforms I think might have a little lull but are going to really continue to uh, to work well and many people have found that their businesses aren't just in a certain mile radius anymore. 
think what I found personally is I've always been on, I've been on, on Skype. I've always video chatted with people, but a lot of people didn't want to do it on the other end because they just weren't comfortable doing that. Now everyone was forced to do this for the course of this last year. Now everyone's comfortable, whether they like it or not is a different story, but saying, Hey, let's do a zoom. It can have me working and speaking with people all over the country, all over the world. And it's obviously, it's not just me. It's everyone. And there's a lot, there's, Lots of business owners I speak to now who really have grown the footprint of their business because now people are much more comfortable do, working online with them. And it's okay that you're not physically handing over a piece of paper to each other. You can send a link in the, in the chat and uh, it, it feels almost just the same. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with uh, what Howard just said. And, um, you know, I hope that we can keep the best of the, the innovations that happened. Um, certainly, I think in a lot of cases, um, people that were were working from home can continue to do that and continue being more productive um, rather than you know rushing back into the office. Like I, I've always, well, not always, but for the past like seven years, I've I've worked um, virtually and online. And so, you know, and from home sometimes. So I was kind of, you know, already a cheerleader for that before COVID, but, um, but even more so now, um, and uh, what Howard said about reaching new, um, new customers or fans is, is so true. Um, not just for businesses, but I know many like organizations, especially nonprofits and, uh, cultural organizations um, by by uh, they never you know put their performances online before COVID and now they have fans in like Australia and you know India and and they're super excited to continue um, having you know online performances. Um, also, I I cover you know municipal governments. Many of them had never before um, had meetings online or use Zoom before. I hope that many of them will continue to do that because it's good for our democratic pr process to have both options. There are mm -hmm. always going to be people that can't attend an in-person meeting. And um, I've already seen some some entities shut down the, the Zoom, though, you know, just to have in-person again. And not really the cost factor. I think you can continue to do both. So. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, I, I really appreciate what Howard said also about the introverts, right? And sort of the need to. It's going to be, you know, alternating before back and forth between in person and online or finding a way to bring online into the in person. Uh, it seems to me there's just, you know, a, a ton of opportunities to really create a more um expansive community um that gets everybody involved and and talking about sort of getting everybody involved on uh, josh it'd be really great to get your perspective on you know one of the biggest challenges we have right now is getting people to shift their purchasing behavior back uh to main street and um you know we really uh, in an earlier session today, we were talking about just this massive shift in consumer behavior, you know, sort of the purchasing from Amazon, having it show up on our front step and never having to see anyone, which is great for Amazon and, you know, Jeff Bezos getting his 13th or 14th home, but it really just devastated local business economies uh, and local economies and everything that they support. And just be interesting to kind of get your perspective is trying to do side and support of shifting with each other to try and encourage people to come back. Have you seen a lot of that? Um, I, I would like to see more of it. Uh, I can talk a little bit about what I'm trying to do. Um, for example, um, we have uh, like the 4th of July coming up. So, you know, we're, we're putting together like a, you know, local business you know, guide for 4th of July and, you know, highlighting, you know, where you can, you know, buy locally sourced ground beef for hamburgers and the hardware store where you can buy charcoal and, um, you know, the produce, the farmer's market, you know, for produce and um, 
that's just an easy way for us to help support local business and remind readers, you know, not to, you know, go just run to Costco for everything. Um, and, you know, the supporting local business is always going to be a process. It involves, you know, mindfulness. And a, a lot of people did achieve more mindfulness during COVID, but I don't want to see them like slide back further. So we're going to do what we can do, but we, we are limited too, because our community for COVID, most businesses were service based. We don't have a lot of retail. So we really have to, you know, um, go above and beyond to, to highlight the businesses that, that do exist. And, um, and we're, we're doing that though. So hopefully readers respond and, you know, um, you know, we'll, we'll see, you know, how, how it goes. Yeah. It, it's interesting to sort of see, you know, we've got um, community groups all, you know, got 3000, 4,000 of them of communities where, um, you know, the community itself can come together and, and talk to each other. And it's interesting just to see the wide range of involvement by community. You have some communities that are really tight and well banded together um, many of whom who have uh, been involved in or recovered from natural disasters before, uh, whether it's a hurricane, an earthquake, a fire, forest fire or whatever. And they kind of, after that, they figured out how to draw everybody back and really rally the troops to kind of move forward. And then there's others that you're really just struggling to try and figure it out. And it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where you're just sharing ideas uh, on an ongoing basis across broader communities, like you said, not just your, your local community, um, can have an enormous impact. Um, so l let's talk about um, the types of communities, um, Howard, that you, when you're coaching your uh, clients, um, what are the type, different types of communities that you kind of want them to think about that maybe not doesn't naturally just come up into their mind of, oh, I should be part of that? Um, there's a few things, but just very quickly on the, on the last point, uh, one sure. thing that I really push with people with, who had brick and mortar locations is to, is to schedule grand reopenings, is to make an event out of reopening their business so that people knew that they were still there, work with the others in the, if, they, if they're in a, a, a outdoor shopping area, so that different flyers from the other businesses are available in, in this location, put up a big banner so that you can try to drive your traffic back into the location in the safe way. But um, one thing I always, one of the key questions I'm asking when I start working with the client is what is their relationship with their customers? What are they doing right now? with um, communicating with them. Do they have an email list? Do they do a newsletter? Do they, do, and, and start with that, but then also what kind of events and promotions are they doing for their, uh, their customers and, and, and looking at what they do for with prospects as well? Because you want to develop some sort of strong rapport, not just transactionally, but socially with these people because then no like and trust is very important and the more they like you and the more that they uh you can build that you can find the way to find the um the customer evangelist which is one of my my favorite terms and and, and uh, is a uh, is a godsend for business so how do you make these relationships into the ones that people are going out and and screaming from the rooftops of how wonderful you are and doing their advertising for you it is trying to develop some different level of social relationship with them. So having a Facebook group, a lineable group that people are able to interact with, uh, of course you have to be careful with, with some of the, the monitoring in, in, in general, but also creating some events and finding different ways that people can socialize, not just a one-on-one -on -one when they come in with you, but different ways, obviously varying on the, on the business, how you can nurture the stronger relationship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know the Happy Neighborhood Project is great at this, but, uh, you know, maybe you can share a couple of the best practices from those sessions. But, you know, so you're a new person joining a community and um, there's definitely a right way and a wrong way to introduce yourself to the community. Um, you know, there's always that person that comes in and is like, yo, I'm the insurance guy. I sell insurance. You should buy it for me. And then there's everybody else that does it the right way. 
Um, can you share a couple of the tips that you guys um, share in your structure with the Happy uh, Neighborhood Project on, on how, to inter- how to join a group and really make a great first impression? Well, we do a disclaimer at the beginning, at least we've, like one of the groups I run here in, in North Florida started with asking a question before we send them out to a breakout room. Okay, by show of hands, who came here to be sold something? And <laughs> everyone looks around and nobody raises their hand. Exactly. You're not here to sell. That's what ne- that's not what networking is about. It's about creating relationships and creating trust, and eventually, whether that becomes a sellable uh, connection, great. Whether it becomes someone that leads you to someone else, great as well. But get to know people, and if we put you in the same room with someone, you've seen them through three times. It's it's fate telling you that you have not learned the right things about them. So go ask questions that really can d- dig deeper into who they are as opposed to what widget they have to uh, provide to you. So it, it, networking in general doesn't work when you get sold to. I remember when I go went to Chamber of Commerce events, I have the insurance guy on one side and the, and, the, uh, and the financial planner on the other, and it felt like every event was like that, and they were just selling me. And it's, look, networking is a, um, a nurtured talent. Not everyone comes in and knows how to network uh, on its own, and there's different skills and different tricks that people have, and and um, those are the people you want to listen to because it's it's absorbing information, utilizing LinkedIn in a in a strong way. One of the biggest things that they do is there's a LinkedIn question of the day, so that for, so it's just Tuesday. So every event that's happening on Tuesday, here's the question, that, and they link up to co-hosts of the help with the distribution at the end of each event. You, you, you put the link into a chat so people can connect on it. And now people from all over the country are making comments on it. So going in and liking a comment and commenting on a comment and then highlighting and clicking and, and introducing yourself to someone, it's a better way to, to really expand your network as well with like-minded people because you, you, each of you found a happy neighborhood project for, uh, for one reason or the other. So as a moderator, or I like to say leader of a group, um, when you encounter that person that comes in who maybe isn't as delicate in their approach, um, do you rely on the community to kind of d- redirect that individual? Do you tend to do it yourself? Do you do it, you know, behind the scenes? What's you, what's your MO? For me, it depends uh, situation by situation. If I, if I have a post in my uh, Facebook group, and all of a sudden, someone's responding to someone else's post, and multiple people with a with a Bitcoin offer. I'm removing them immediately. I don't want. I want. I don't want to know what their motivation was in in uh, in posting that strategy. If I see someone just making a um, I was to say a, a faux pas, um, I would reach out to them on the side and have a conversation and uh, and address it. Um, sometimes that that works. Sometimes it doesn't. That's uh, when when the the uh, the, the abilities of a moderator is you, you can remove someone from the situation very easily if, if they're not as uh, as open to conversation as as you'd like them to be. Awesome. And Josh, when you were sort of dealing with the third rail issues uh, in the communities that you were a part of, yeah, you know, how did you see that kind of play out? Did you did you feel like you had to kind of you know set the tone publicly of you know, hey, this is not a place to be sold to? Uh, type of a statement, or did you kind of take it offline one on one and try and deal with it? Well, I mean, my primary vehicle for community traditionally has been the Facebook page for my site, and so, and you know, I'm basically controlling the flow of information on that. It's not like a Facebook group, which we do have, but you know, in in this same community. And that is sort of like a never ending stream of advertising. And, you know, that's, I I mean, it, I guess it's a personal preference, you know, but um, Mm -hmm. I think that, and I'm biased here, but um, any new business coming in should certainly have a budget for advertising their new business, no matter what it is. Like, don't expect, you know, that your, you know, your free Facebook posts are going to do all the work, you know, of getting the, the word out about your business. Um, I've seen so many businesses that don't ever even think of that before they launch. So um, I'm not saying, you know, advertise with 
talk in source, but you know, you have to, you have to have a budget for that. And, you know, also going back to the newsletter issue, I mean, I know a lot of places started newsletters during COVID, which is awesome because it is a great way to keep in, you know, in touch with your community, but don't like overdo it and send out too many newsletters because there's nothing more annoying than that, than getting a newsletter, you know, that, that you, one more newsletter that you don't need and, uh, you know, just reserve their use, use them respectfully and, you know, sparingly, I would say, um, you know, maybe, maybe every twice a month or something like that. It really depends on the type of business. But I mean, I'm a news business and I don't even send out a daily newsletter. So I try and be very um, cognizant of how busy people are. And um, you have to, you have to do that or you're going to lose community members. Yeah. That's a great point. You know, when I was back in the email marketing world, it was always say, put yourself in the recipient's inbox and ask yourself, you know, why should I care? Um, and it's a great, great insights as, you know, you're joining these groups. It's awesome. Often like that awkward moment of walking into a networking event and not knowing anybody and not knowing what to say. And do you just turn around and walk away? And, you know, just trying that, um, you know, being honest about something and, you know, hey, I got a question about this. Does anybody have a perspective? Right. You know, we had um, an individual that joined. Uh, I was in um, Topeka, Kansas, who uh, went into the local community and he, he just basically he was an insurance guy. And he, and he said, hey, if there's um, if you have any of your clients that are uh, using um, their employees to deliver their products to customers, you should make sure you have these two things in your insurance policy. Right. And it was just a beautiful statement of help. Right. Use your expertise, share your expertise and don't expect anything back in return. And it turned out that then everybody sort of started piling on to that conversation and saying, well, what about this scenario? How would you deal with it? And, and all of a sudden that person became like the go to insurance expert in, in Topeka, Kansas. And it was fascinating to watch um, because, you know, if you joined the community and just said, said, I shall bit sell business insurance, there would have been crickets. Um, so, you know, I think it kind of challenged all of the people who are attendees here in these groups to, um, that the groups that you're a part of, whether on Alignable and Facebook or wherever, you know, try that um, with the group members. Try just asking a question or sharing a little bit of expertise without the anticipation of, of you know, trying to sell something um, and just see how see what happens. I think you'll, you'll really be amazed. Um, so, so Howard, I was checking out your website in advance of this discussion, and I noticed on your website you asked people to ask you a question, which I find is brilliant, right? It's like, hey, just ask me anything, and I'll share some roots. Um, I, I thought it would be interesting to, to get your perspective on, you know, some examples of the best questions that people have asked you. And, you know, do you find uh, ways to then take those questions and answers and and push them out to a community anywhere so that other people can kind of build on it? Or, or how do you do, what do you do with all those great questions people ask you? Uh, I'm trying to be gentle with my answer. I, I wish a lot of them were great questions. Um, hmm. I got, and it, it, I like the, the, I like the tactic of having it on the website. Um, definitely led to a lot of spam, uh, but I did yeah. sift through it to get a lot of, from Russia. <laughs> but I did get, get, <laughs> get through it and, and get some questions from people really asking some questions. Look, a lot of it boiled down to how do I get leads? How can I uh, get my message out there broader? The, 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 the questions that, that I, I received were not um, – the, there was no real um, uh, golden ticket type question that came out of them. They were, most of the questions are always – the same, and I, and I also had a lot of people reach out to me through my networking. I said, look, if you have it, I'm here to answer questions. Don't worry about, I'm not here to sell you anything. If you have a question, let me answer it. And a lot of them were, how do I get, how do I get a message out when no one's listening? How do I get, uh, how do I get people to come to my website? Um, a lot of that answer is you have to redo your website because most websites aren't built for people to actually have conversations with you when you're, when you're there. 
and uh, there's a lot of uh, refocus that has to get done. Um, mm -hmm. what, what I learned through a lot of this is that most businesses um, skipped a lot of steps because of when before they opened, a lot of it because they didn't know how what to do before opening a business. So there are a lot of little issues that came up and, and um, I'm working on a book right now that really tries to answer those questions in more of a conversation form than a textbook form, but formulating the fact that most people went to college and learned to be an employee and not how to be a business owner. So here's what you need to do. This is small business owner 101 that you need to understand before starting your business, getting you up to that launch and marketing phase. And that's a whole other conversation after that. Mm -hmm. So let me shift gears just a little bit as we've got um, about 10, 15 minutes left. Um, so as you think about, you know, the going forward, um, which of the communities that you belong to are you think, do you think will um, provide you with the greatest uh, business opportunity? Right. I mean, there's you can join lots of different types of groups, but which ones do you kind of look at and you say, these are my soulmates. These are the ones I want to stick with for a long period of time um, versus these are the ones that just kind of got me through the the onslaught. I mean, I'll jump. You go, go, Josh. I was just going to say, I mean, I'll. I'm not I'm not totally sure how to answer that because I feel like I'm at, like personally my business is in a transitional period now where we're you know um, moving away from the Facebook you know old Facebook paradigm towards you know other things and I'm not sure ultimately where we're going to end up um, but we're certainly what is it what is it what is it that's causing you to kind of shift away from that um. I think a lot of it is is not not having the tools through Facebook to manage the community the way I believe it needs to be managed. Um, just you know, there's a, a huge emphasis on you know engagement, uh, obviously, but it's not always quality engagement. So um, you know, give me some you know support in terms of like know keeping it at a higher level and and that's just not there and it's not going to be coming so i uh you know i'm putting a lot more emphasis into my podcast my newsletter um and uh you know certainly looking at other options like alignable um mm -hmm. and and linkedin and um you know i think everybody should you know Keep their options open and and just you know take a step back and look at you know what what the value is in the in the community that they have now. I, I know in a lot of cases it is Facebook based and you know um, this is a great opportunity to you know take a a longer look at at the big picture and um, mm -hmm. and I you know ultimately we can all benefit if we do that. Super. Howard, did you have any? Yeah, looking, like, Facebook groups have changed. Um, I have one in particular that they, well, I'm, it wasn't just me. They got rid of the questions before uh, entering a public group. So people can just join the group where the tool for the group owner was, that was an opportunity to get email addresses and build lists and, and among other things. It did, however, uh, for whatever reason, put into high gear the amount of people that joined the group. Um, in the time that it, uh, it, they've taken that away, the group has tripled. The key to the groups is the people. It's not always the interaction in the group, and that's just not just something that I'm running, but other groups that I'm in, that I'm look, if I'm looking for business owners and I'm in different business owner groups, you have access to those lists of people who are in the group, and you can come up with your own program to interact with them and messaging them if someone messages you on uh on facebook now and you're not not friends with them it does show up that there's there's these at the top as opposed to being hidden away and you find seven months worth of messages that people try to reach you so you can reach out to people if you click on their profile and then do some research and figure if they're the type of person you want to reach out to 
here's a way to uh, to interact with them and they can get to know you very quickly by going back and looking at your Facebook page. So it sounds like an important piece of that community is whether it's a breakout room or just going off and having a one-on-one -on -one discussion is that ability to find quality people through the interactions that you're doing on the group, but then have a very simple vehicle through which you can then jump out and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation um, and get to know them and build that relationship. Everything still comes down to know, like, and trust. And if you can make it a little bit faster process to on some of them, then they can learn a little bit more about the other pieces and, and how that, uh, how it, it merits them in, in the relationship. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and so let's go back to that introvert thing. Um, and, you know, for those of us that are extroverts or, or enjoy those type of situations, that's one thing. But, you know, there's this group of folks who are very introverted, who shied away from those in-person events that now had the virtual events and felt like they belonged. Um, what advice do you have to them and for people that want them to continue to be a part of their groups, to embrace that community, um, or as an introvert, be a, continue to be a part of that community. What, what advice would you give them in terms of how they participate and, and uh, the, the things that they can do to sort of stay connected? If it's a group that was meeting online that then becomes a live event now, um, the good thing for the introvert is they're not going in cold. They know these people already. They've had conversations with them. So that that situation is the easiest one that they're just now that that fear of, of what, how they can react when I when I open my mouth isn't as much there anymore. It could still be there based on the level of how, how much how introverted they are. Um, when it comes to groups on Alignable on on Facebook, there, there are again, you're protected because you're still behind the screen making and making your comments. Uh, so there there are ways to interact with people and, and like their, their information and that's gonna continue and I think that's gonna just keep on growing. Uh, when it comes to the big broader events, uh, it's a, a little bit of the same. You gotta just uh, take a deep breath and uh, put your best foot forward. Is there a favorite question that you have when you know an introvert is, is coming into your group on you know, a question you ask them that you can then push out to the group that makes them feel welcome? The break, the icebreaker? My, my icebreaker has always been, and it's been a great one, but what, what brought you here today, which, uh, and which is different than what do you do, who are you? So it, uh -huh. it's, it, there's a little bit more roundness to it. And I've always been a big fan of who do you serve as opposed to what do you do? I like that. How about you, Josh? Any any tidbits of knowledge on breaking into a new group? Well, I mean, I I definitely thinking about this in two ways, because I mean I definitely consider myself to be an introvert. Um and but a functionally extroverted introvert. So um, I, uh, I certainly can relate to anybody that's feeling anxious because of, you know, in-person events becoming, you know, co coming back to being center stage. Um, I don't think, I think it's hard to expect to get the results we want without going to in-person events. So I would definitely recommend that you spend some time like working on strategies to make yourself feel comfortable going to them. Like I think one good thing, one thing that's helpful is just to spend like maybe five minutes thinking about things you want to talk about with a few people that you know are going to be there. And um, that way you, you have sort of like security blanket mentally going into that event. And, and I've used that as a uh, sort of a mental trick to get myself in the door and then usually once you're there, you know, you're fine and you might not even remember, you know, what those things are. So, um, but it's just more to get you across the threshold. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, you have to assess your own comfort level and um, if you're going to be so, you know, up, you know, anxious that you're not going to, uh, 
you know, be comfortable or presenting, you know, yourself the way you want to, then, then you don't want to go until you, that you can do that. Um, but hopefully we'll continue to have more of a, of a mix of, you know, in-person and virtual events, like sort of on a, on a permanent basis. And I think, uh, you know, um, it'll be, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Yeah, it's great advice to, you know, all those people that run the events and uh, want to keep those, the everybody coming back as we shift to in-person is really to put yourself out there. You know, if, if you're a leader or a moderator of a group, you probably are pretty much of an extrovert to begin with, but to really put yourself out there as the person who's more than happy to, you know, be the person to walk other people around the room and be the person that introduces people and gets that conversation started because, um, you know, it'd be wonderful to kind of continue this process of expanding the audiences of these communities and really getting everybody um, coming together, especially as all the our communities look to, to recover um, from uh, the COVID crisis. It's going to take everybody um, and uh, being inclusive and bringing people in is, is uh, super critical. Well, I'm just going to check real quick, and we've got about two minutes left. Any final thoughts as we wrap up um, that you guys would like to convey about com communities? My, my one other thing. Hey, oops. Go, Josh. <laughs> I was just going to say one other thing, um, you know, that sort of based on what we were just talking about, if, it could be whether you're an introvert or not, but, you know, consider you know for networking or getting your name out there using an, an intermediary like a local news source you know to help spread your message you know do you know put out a news release or you know i have uh somebody who writes a column for me who has a book that became a bestseller on amazon and you know i congratulated him on linkedin and you know then that you know helped both of us so you know um be a little more um, think outside the box. What basically is what it comes down to with with you know instead yeah. of just oh I'm just gonna post you know what I you know an ad for my business. Um, be that's a, a that's more. a great great tip because you think about it you know when you think about groups you're always thinking about what am I gonna say what am I gonna do and the simplest thing to do is just to sell somebody hey that's a really great comment or just mm -hmm. like it and share it or it just you know give them a pat on the back. Um, yeah. So, awesome point. And awesome. Very well, it looks like Just we're wrapping up. Go ahead, Howard. Just go participate is all I want to add. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh, on, on behalf of the Small Business Aid and uh, all of our attendees, wanted to thank you guys for sharing some of your your insights and experiences over the over the years, and in particular these past fifteen months. Um, uh, we appreciate we greatly appreciate you being here today and sharing your perspectives and. Uh, I hope for everybody that was in attendance that you, you picked up on some tips and uh, you'll go be, join some additional new communities. Uh, we'd love to have you join more on Alignable, but they're, they're all over the place. And, uh, um, you know, reach out if we can be of any help along the way. So uh, take care, everybody. And uh, Dave, I'll kick it back over to you. Thank you, for everyone, for attending this session of Small Biz Aid Live. To continue the conversation, please join the Alignable Small Business Group at the link I just provided in chat. Recordings of these sessions will be available within 48 hours, and links to each of these recorded sessions will be posted on our event page within the event within the agenda. If you want to move over to track two or track three, then please you'll need to re-sign in with the with the different link that we've provided you. We look forward to seeing you over there. Take care, everybody.